I'm Kayak Kevin, and this is my Chesapeake Bay Tour. My love of touring stems from my love of maps. Even as a kid, I knew that maps were a window to the world. When I was five, I wanted a wall-sized map of the United States. Mom and Dad said it would have to wait till Christmas. That was too long of a wait, so I made one myself. I drew each state on a piece of paper, cut it out, and taped it to the wall. Although each state was the same size, it got the job done. My first tour in 2003 was 500 miles from the Georgia-Florida border to Virginia. The second, in 2004, 200 miles from Oregon Inlet, North Carolina to Ocean City, Maryland. Third, and the longest, was from Pensacola, Florida, the long way around the state, to Virginia. 1,800 miles, and it took me four and a half months to do. My fourth tour, in 2007, was the shortest, 180 miles from Virginia Beach to Delaware Bay. In 2008, I did 200 miles around the Virginia section of the Chesapeake Bay. Seeing firsthand what a point on a map looks like is why I paddle there. It's why I tour, and this is my sixth one. It is good to train before a tour. Along with studying the maps and the charts, training consists of spending as much time as you possibly can paddling for miles and getting used to being in your boat for hours at a time. I paddle with as much weight as I can put in my boat. Because the first day of the tour with a fully loaded boat, is a 15 mile crossing of the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. When I'm paddling across the mouth of the bay, I stay right next to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. This helps me get out of the current by using the pilings, and I can also stop at each one of the four islands as I'm crossing. I'm a little over halfway here at the fourth island and it's gotten really windy. It's a southeast wind, probably 10 to 15 at this point, and that is a crosswind here. So I'm getting all this, all every wave is going over. I just had to bail out of my bow, water getting inside. And that's the major issue with my tour boat. My bow hatch lets a little water in with every wave splash. My stern hatch is secure with a neoprene hatch cover, but impossible to access on the water. And I've got multiple small leaks with all the rivet holes. I've got about six more miles. It's pretty bad. Hopefully I'll make it. Well, I did make it. Six more miles of waves washing over. My boat filled up to the point of being dead in the water. I was within two and a half miles from getting here, or getting, getting to be able to stay on my boat. And I, I was taking too much water on and had to get a ride. But luckily, I was out in the middle of nowhere, and luckily a guy came by named Thomas Scott and saved me. Got me, pulled me, pulled me to the shoreline because I was about ready to go in. Get the baler and start the bailing. Once the water level gets to a certain height over top of the gunnel, there's no, there's no keeping the water out. I bailed out and paddled to Sunset Beach, where Shante was waiting and worried because the winds came up and it took me so long, but with a little help, I got across. The next few days, I took it easy on getting any distance in. I took my time, hit some fishing spots along the way north. Woohoo! I release any fish that I catch on tour. I don't even bring cooking gear anymore. It just takes too much time out of a paddling day. I stopped at the Cape Charles jetty 
and caught a few flounder waiting for the winds to die down. I had a steady headwind for a few miles and I stopped at Savage Neck for a break. I got a north wind. It's 10. It's just annoying. I don't feel like paddling in it anymore. So I'm just going to stay here. It's a good spot. Real good spot. Beautiful beach. And tomorrow for the next couple days, I'm supposed to have south wind. So I'll make up my time and get the crest field before my water runs out. This is my tide gauge. The one here is putting sticks into the water. One right at the water line. One above the water line. And the one below the water line. And this will help me read what the tide's doing, what the water's actually going up and down. The tide's coming in. Which gave me a current to push me a little farther north. The wind's finally died down. Decided to make a jump for it. I feel a little bit better than the day if I just get a couple more miles. As I'm coming to a beach, I like to look for a flat spot. I need a flat spot for my tent. So I'm always kind of scanning, looking for a level area. This would be a small level area. I set up above the highest high tide mark. This area has a unique underwater topography. The majority of the coastline has an outside sandbar which runs parallel to the beach. I got trapped in the low tide. The sloughs between the bar and the beach is filled with healthy underwater grasses. A prime nursery for some of our best game fish in the bay. This is red drum territory so I've always got my eyes open ready to see one. My target beach for today was the one that I camped on on the Virginia Bay tour. If I was going to rank the top 10 beaches, this would be on that list. With its remoteness, large campable beach, and beautiful background scenery, this is one of my favorites. Just came to cast at this point. They must be nesting here because they're mad at me. Appreciate the local knowledge and the help. Brooks from the Eastern Shore came out and met me this morning and told me about a marina inside that I could top off my waters for the next few hot days. Why don't you just come over here and refill your waters? Pull right up to the side. Marinas with a floating dock are very important on tour. The winds died out and I was able to make it to another favorite camp on Beach Island. When I see there are large critters around, I make a pea barrier around my tent. This tells any curious critters that there is a large carnivorous male mammal on this beach. On days like this where it's blowing and I'm pretty much stuck on the beach, go over my baths, try not to eat all my food all day. Hopefully tomorrow will be forecasted to be lighter winds. All done today was listen to radio, kill horse flies, and eat. I've become just a big, uh, big horse fly trap. Bugs are just a part of touring. Every night I get in my tent, I spend at least 20 minutes killing the no seams of mosquitoes that follow me in. This is my nightly critter kill. 60 miles per hour. These storms were located along a line extending from 12 miles north of Deal Island to 7 miles east of Piney Point and moving southeast at 30 miles per hour. Pretty much a line across the... ...damaging winds and close to the wash area. 
across the whole area. <laughs> Gonna get hit. First storm of the tour. I'm just batting down the hatches. I've uh, put my rods down, strapped everything down. It's not going to blow away. Look at this. Usually the wind blast from the front part of these storms doesn't last that long. I'm actually a little worried about this part getting washed over now. It's coming up on high tide. It's gonna build over here. But it's too late to move my tent. I can't do it in this wind. It's a tough call. And then blasted a steady 30, 35 miles an hour for over an hour. It never rained. But when the floor of my tent got wet, I knew what had happened. Wash over. Storm last night pushed a lot of, a lot of wind, a lot of water on this side of the island. Full moon, high tide, and I had wash over. This was completely washed over. My tent was right there. So while I was moving it, I broke my tent pole pressure on it and had sand all caked in and water inside of it so I broke my tent pole. Eastern Shore kayak fisherman Michael Barnes told me about the Deep Creek Marina close by where Shante could meet me with a new tent. Then I was back out looking for a campsite for the night. Yeah this island's good to camp on. Great spot but a lot of birds nesting here. You can tell by as soon as I walked up as soon as I started getting close they started Yelling like this one's coming right at me. Look at this one. But I think the birds own this one. See another beach right across the way. Hopefully less birds. Birds really like islands because they don't have that many predators on them. just walk down to the, that tree area down there and the, and the deer flies and the horse flies were really intense down there and that's one of the reasons why I pick areas that are a little bit more open and not so many trees around it is because the flies and stuff aren't aren't I mean they're in here in the marsh grass but they're not as heavy as they are in a wooded area so I'm always trying to find a wide open spot and I can always get a breeze out here wasn't any breeze in there winds coming from the southeast and right here I get a little bit of a breeze back there it was dead calm so I'm always looking for an open spot. Before crossing the Pocomoke Sound, I stopped on Long Point just outside of Saxus. I bypassed camping on this place the first time around. But it was only noon and way too early to call it a day. This is another really cool spot. I just crossed the Virginia and Maryland state line. In Maryland now. Just drifted over. So when I cut across the Pocomoke Sound, the wind and the, and the current pushed me in east of my target channel. So now I've come in and realized that I've, I've missed it. So I've got to go back into the wind another couple miles until I find these channel markers and then find my channel. It's kind of going on memory. I was thinking that that tree line was what I was looking for, but it wasn't. It's right in the middle of the marsh. So my easy kind of 
with the wind day became an in the wind day. Eh, that's what happens when I don't pay attention to where I'm at. Took me an hour and a half, had them away, but I found them. Found the channel markers and the channel, which I took to the outside beach of Crisfield. It was a little too late in the day for a marina stop. I'm waiting to have one of these things as I'm walking around this mud latch onto my feet. Today I head into Crisfield for a couple hours for a marina stop. Crisfield, Maryland, crab capital of the world, the town that the blue crab built. This is my weekly marina stop, so I always try to stop at a marina to do my laundry, take a shower, and uh, go to a grocery store. And most transient friendly marinas will have all this stuff where you just kind of pay a dinghy fee. See if you're coming in with a sailboat, you can moor off and then bring your dinghy inside and uh, so you don't have to bring your whole sailboat in here. So I pay 10 bucks, I get access to all the showers, the laundry rooms, um, can even rent a bike for, for I think $3 to get me to the grocery store and I got water and everything. Everything I need, recharge my batteries, everything I need is right here. My diet is simple, protein with tuna, good canned tuna and olive oil, not the runny, oily vegetable oil. It may cost a little bit more, but it's way worth it. Carbs and sugars with Pop Tarts and Smarties for a snack. There's one big old bag of Pop Tarts. I tear off all the labels and then mark on the bottom what they are. Since these are all the same thing, these are all tuna and olive oil. And I do this because there's always water in my boat and this paper will just get real messy. With 10 to 15 pounds of Pop-Tarts, 20 pounds of tuna, and 10 gallons of water, I'm out looking for another campsite for tonight. Check that out. It's a hospital with a dock. How's that for a water town? Well, I took the wind and made it across the Big Animesix River and made it to this point. I'm going to get socked down with winds for tomorrow and then northwest winds coming off of here the next day. It's supposed to lighten up in the afternoon. I might be able to creep my way a little couple more miles. Creeping along slowly but surely. Creeping along. Last night about 3 in the morning, the tide came up and I had some wash over. The first one came over and I moved my boat right in front of my tent and then I dug this trench with the barrier to hopefully keep the waves off of me and I blocked it from keeping my tent getting wet. With the wind blowing today all I could do was get in five miles but it was better than sitting on the beach board. It's blowing again. It's supposed to drop out but it's blowing right in my face where I'm trying to go. That's the bridge you got to cross tomorrow. So hopefully I have the winds to be able to get over there out through that bridge and out through the top of Deal Island is what I'm trying to do tomorrow. When I finally got that wind window, it was late, and I was in for a long paddling afternoon. The last five miles, I had an opposing current, which made it even longer. That was a long afternoon. I didn't launch until 3 because the winds didn't die out till then, but uh, I made it. And this is a pretty cool spot. The next day, I had to wait till noon for the winds to die out, but I got some miles in and made it to the next camp at Clay Island. It's pretty much an oasis right there. Beautiful, can't wait to get on it. This place is great. This real intricate, windy creek in the back. Very remote spot, there's no houses anywhere for miles. Great spot. Only problem is, I do have neighbors. Haven't seen them yet, but 
I'm staying here tonight. They're gonna have to deal with me, or I'm gonna have to deal with them. Camping pretty much right next to them. It's the biggest part of the beach. Over here, it's washed over from last night. And on the spit, it's washed over. This is the only spot that I can possibly not get washed over if another storm comes from the northwest, and blows a lot of wind across this bay here. Another windy day today. Calmed down there for about five minutes. I got excited, but it ain't looking too good for today. But the next couple of days might be a little bit better. Kind of looked at me again like, what are you doing? What are you still doing here? <laughs> yeah. Just one of them, I think. But it's gotten kind of chilly. Hopefully tomorrow I get off this beach and get to the next point. Over the horizon over there. Last night when I woke up, there were three foxes on and around my boat. I left the Pop-Tart wrapper in there and they kind of got into that. I always put everything that's edible by critters inside my boat. I lock it inside so they don't get to it. This is my second day stuck here with strong north winds. It's supposed to lighten up this afternoon. I'm hoping to get off, but this is frustrating. I've been on for two weeks and I've barely gone over 100 miles. All right, I'm just pretty much over it. My plan is I'm gonna go up this coastline and stay out of the wind chop and cross over where the gap is only a mile and a half. I'm just really sick of sitting here today. This is the second day in a row and I've already pulled up my tent. I'm already ready to go. I'm over it, I'm going. Totally worth paddling into that into that wind for that long to get this much of a tailwind. This is a nice tailwind too. Dragonflies were a constant companion in this section of the bay. Waiting on horseflies. Friendly companions because they hunt and eat horseflies. I'm surprised I just got bit by a horsefly with all these, with all these dragonflies here. Um, come on guys, what are you doing? Get them. Here, here. They didn't want the horsefly if I killed it and tried to feed it to them. They wanted it alive, to catch it and kill it themselves. They would hang out near me, or even on me, waiting for the horseflies to get within their range. Then they would launch off with lightning speed and grab the horseflies in midair. Ooh, look at that one, that one's cool. Oh, that one's got dragonfly or zebra colors. That one's kind of purplish. Oh, where'd he go? Oh, this is awesome. If it stays like this, I won't get bit. Look at all these. Natural bug spray. Ooh. There you go. Natural bug spray. Horse fly killers. Don't let me get bit, guys. You stay on me. I could have stayed on the dragonfly beach, but it was still early in the day, and I had time to paddle. Here's another example of an outstanding beach, remote and beautiful. Sand fleas come out at sunset. If they land on you, they'll bite you. But these camouflage sand spiders come out and hunt the sand fleas all night. This is the exact opposite of what they were forecasting last night before I went to bed. They said it was supposed to be south 5 to 10 today. 
This is northwest at 10 to 15. I guess they're saying it's supposed to drop out later this afternoon or at least come down a little bit. But the good thing is I can get on the other side of these islands, of the Hooper Islands, and get out of the wind. All right, I just saw red over these flats. These are those Maui Gym HT lenses. Perfect for this. I don't know if you can tell the difference. I saw on the satellite imagery that there was a beach here at the mouth of this creek. I get here and there's rock jetties. When, when you put rock jetties out, sand moves away from those spots or gets displaced. So now I'll be camping on this shell mound. Not real comfortable, but this is all I got now. It's too windy tomorrow to go the outside route. I'm going to take the inside route. Looks like it'll be kind of cool. I think my navigation skills get me through there. It looks kind of windy, but it takes me where I need to get. Taylor's Island, the Cove Point, is the narrowest point in the bay below the Bay Bridge. I got my first glimpse of the other side and the Calvert Cliffs. It's almost getting funny with this weather forecast. You know, I knew they were calling for it to be 5 to 10 today, and I knew it wasn't going to be. The way that wind was blowing last night and continuously blowing last night, it wasn't going to. So I'm going to the inside today. I'm going to take this inside route. Uh, the four, one for a change and two to get out of this goddamn wind corridor that I've been going through for the last week. It's much better coming inside these creeks today, but you know, there's always that risk of getting lost in the creeks if you're going to navigate in unmarked or unfamiliar and unmarked areas. And the key is just knowing where I'm at at every, every moment. Every time I come around a corner, I check my maps, make sure that 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 angle or that point is there I'm on the right spot always checking the compass making sure that's in the right spot I'm going in the right direction it's, it's matching up with the map and that's the thing is just matching it up make sure you're at the right spot to all, at, you know where you're at the whole time because as soon as you don't know where you are that's when you can take a wrong turn another thing is just following the current My goal today was to top off my water bottles. So I landed and resupplied at Cove Bait and Tackle at Chapel Cove Marina. The winds actually died out in the afternoon and I was able to get some miles behind me and get into the Chop Tank River. Cool spot though, the uh, house is abandoned, there's nobody in it and I've got a good flat spot kind of out of the way here. You've got an open spot for some breeze, so it's a good spot. This morning the NOAA forecast was southwest 5 to 10. Well, this is northwest at 10. So <laughs> here again, the NOAA forecast has been wrong. But I was able to paddle along the shoreline and get to the narrows just as the wind died. But when the breeze died out, it got terribly hot. I got a pretty decent sight here. But ducks and geese have been all over it, so there's geese poop and it's kind of nasty everywhere. So I'm gonna get a try to get a rake and try to sweep it off. Seem like a stick. This might work right here. Um,
<laughs> How cool is that? All right, that made my day. It was a hard day. It's a hot day. That's pretty cool. With another hot and calm day, I was able to get some distance in. I could smell the exhaust from the bridge a mile away. And it was a shock to my ears. This is all sweat. Completely soaked. Not even a chance to dry out. It's so hot and humid out here. I think they said it hit one, 101. Yeah. It was so hot, the ospreys didn't even want to yell at me as I paddled close to their nest. Eastern Neck Island was the ending target for the day. That's all sweat for me the last couple of days for my shirt. I haven't gone through any waves that had that be salt water. That's all sweat. Here's my boat, ready for today's launch. It's set up every day, same way, and this is for the entire day out in the water. My boat is an ocean kayak Manta. Named from its bow flare, it is a true sit-on-top touring kayak. 16 foot long, with access to the entire hull through its bow and stern hatches. On the bow is a deck rope for tying off at the floating docks. I use maps and charts for navigation. Each gives me something different. What's on the land and what's in the water. Up front I have my AFCO sandals, just so I can get out on a rocky shoreline or a shell shoreline. My water bottle is covered with a towel to keep the sun off. My deck watch is for distance timing. My foot pegs are padded with a can coolie and towels. I have a spot for my toothpick and chapstick. I use long strips from a t-shirt for my leg sunscreens. My compass is between my knees and my seat is the Surf to Summit GTS Expedition Seat. My paddle is an aqua bound swell, real thin touring paddle. And here behind me, I have my tackle box. I have my camera case, my Surf to Summit camera case. I have it riveted to the deck. It's secure and easy to access. I have a towel to cover up all over everything back here. This keeps the sun off of the gear in my crate. I have gulps inside here, this little package here. I have five waters stuck in the back here. And I also have my life jacket on this side. My crate holds my AM FM radio, my iPod with the radio transmitter, VHF radio, a few pair of my Maui Gym sunglasses, tuna for today on the water, sunscreen, can opener and fork, still camera, binoculars, spot satellite tracker on for today. One rod holder is from the camera mounted monopod. Two fishing poles, leader line, and my Aquaskins Bayman rain jacket is secured to the back of the crate. Under the stern hatch strap is my garbage and my beach chair. And that's how my boat is set up for today. I headed into Rock Hall for a marina stop. Rock Hall Landing Marina is a transient friendly stop. They have a bike rental and a grocery store in town for resupply.
got a good spot here. But this is weird because I haven't been on a pebble beach before. So uh, I think I actually might need to wear my sandals on here. This is pretty rocky. There's a ton of debris on this beach. I mean, this must get a lot of wash. But you know, Baltimore's right across the water. I mean, it's understandable why this is as junky as it is. Yeah, I think it's gonna be real calm tomorrow. I'm gonna be able to really get some movement. This is pretty good. I tell you, I'm almost at the top. This is pretty cool. Came pretty fast to me on this one. Definitely. Pretty stoked. I'm gonna have a good day tomorrow. Paddling into a very cool area of the bay, and the cliffs were beginning to get larger. This is such an environment change. Now, there's no barnacles. I'm actually staring barefooted on rocks, which, if this was salt water, there'd be barnacles on it. There's freshwater grasses. You know, I'm, I'm paddling through and I keep pushing these same bald eagles out that are, they keep moving north as I'm moving north. This is amazing. This is just an ama for me. It's just been a an amazing transition into another environment that I haven't paddled into before. There's even rocks out here in the middle that you gotta watch out for. <laughs> Never been on a tour where I've looked up so much. <laughs> Everything's. Up, I mean, as I'm coming along the shoreline, I'm stretching my neck out. It's about time one of these eagles flew to my south behind me. Today, it's been every time I turn a corner, I see something really cool. You know, up ahead of me. I mean, more cliffs and beaches. I mean, this is just amazing. This is just amazing. This is really cool. When I got to the mouth of the Sassafras River, I had to make a decision. I could have camped there at the point, but it was still early enough in the day to keep paddling to the spit inside the Sassafras River. But the east wind is coming real hard. There's an incoming current, so the waves are really kicking up in the middle. So what I'm doing is just trying to creep right along the side. There's less current, but there's also less chop. I slowly crept along the shoreline, and in two hours, made it to my destination. And this is a great sight, sand, and I'm within 10 miles of the top of the bay. Man, that was a cool day. I mean, this area just changed as I paddled. Every corner was a new cliff and a new beach to look at. I mean, I, it's like fresh water. Uh, it doesn't even taste salty anymore. There's no barnacles, there's no oysters. Uh, you know, I barely see seagulls out here. Today, I get to the top of the bay. This is Turkey Point. It separates where the channel leaves the bay and heads into the Chesapeake Delaware Canal. And I'm going to the Susquehanna Flats. I felt like I have just paddled into the mountains. All right, a day under three weeks, made it to the top of the bay. Now I'm heading on back. Now my plan was to circle here and go down Aberdeen Proving Grounds, but that's a long stretch. Yeah, they blow some stuff up over there to Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And then I have to go by the Baltimore channels and all that stuff. So I'm gonna go back on the western side and cross at the Bay Bridge in a couple days. This shoreline really looks like a freshwater lake. And I think this is petrified wood. I 
I got stopped by an afternoon storm and wasn't sure if I was going to get any more miles in. I checked my phone and Al Stillman and Chris Parsons from Kayak Fishing Magazine had a campsite at Elk Neck State Park where I was able to take a few days off. My dad and stepmom Karen came up to see me. I knew my dad would enjoy this area. Every year when I was a kid, we used to canoe the upper part of the James River. Al had a cool inflatable tandem kayak to take his kids out. We headed out to Turkey Point to fish in the crazy weekend boat traffic. It was cool hanging out with Al, Chris, and the kids. I was well rested and ready to paddle. I headed south and made it to Rocky Point before sunset. Very cool spot. Got this little rock jetty out here, real natural rock jetty. I just got to clear off the space up here. Get my tent above uh, high tide wash level. So trying to figure out where that's going to be. Got to get to work. This right here is what I'm worried about at high tide. High tide's right there. You get a big ship wake coming in. This is a, a, a tanker just went by. And that's where I get washed over. Not because of storms or lunar high tides. It's boat wakes that really makes, makes it bad out here. You get a big ship coming through at high tide. Now I got water in my tent. Boat out in the channel. Got high tide and see if let's see if this is gonna give me a wake. I wanted to spend more time in this area, so I didn't want to paddle too far. I made a marina stop to fill up my water bottles and decided to camp close by. On the way back out, I had this on my tail. Damn. I'm gonna stick it close to shore, even though I can beeline straight there, just in case that wind shifts. And here it comes. No. I don't want to miss my target because of a 40 mile an hour wind. Whoa. Whoa. Off before I lose this thing. I launched and took it easy today, enjoying the beach art and this driftwood duck blind. I'm paddling close to shore, you have to watch out for these things. At Tolchester Beach, I ran into these kids that I talked to on the way up. Zach and Dylan. Zach and Dylan. Zach and Dylan gave me a little, little spinning. Hopefully, I might be able to catch something with this. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. <laughs> this is awesome. It doesn't take long. These things are hitting. Look at that. Ooh.
All the fishing gear that I brought with me was too big for the fishery up here. Oh, I'm never going to get to where I wanted to get today because I keep fishing. These guys hooked me up right. I couldn't catch anything until Zach and Dylan gave me that small spinner bait. Ooh. Ooh. A little bigger, I think. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? There has been high than normal high tides. So I've put myself up on a flat spot well above high tide, pull my boat up as high as I can, and even tie it off tonight just to be sure. Because all it takes is a real high, high tide and one of those big ships to come through to wash out the beach. Yesterday they were calling for, for the winds to be north at five. This is southwest at 10. It sucks. I'm here at Rock Hall. Rock Hall. I just got some more lures and I'm still catching these white perch nonstop. It's outstanding. I'm ready to move. There's rocks all along the shoreline that I'm going. I'm just going to fish all day. Tomorrow is supposed to be nice and hot and calm. That means I can move. So my plan is to get to that beach on Eastern Neck Island where they have those wave breakers out front. I had a good tailwind and a good paddle for a while before I was forced off the water. That got real bad. When I last had the camera on, it was 15. Now it's going 20, 25, probably even pushing 30. Amazing. Won't be able to camp here. High tide's here. Ah, not a good situation. Hope it drops out enough for me to go somewhere. Whew. Wind's not forecasted to stop, but the tide's gotten low, so the, there's an outside break with little chop on the inside. I mean, it's still white water, but as long as I stay really close to shore, I should be okay. The solid tailwind was pushing me. All I really had to do was keep my boat straight. Wow, I made it. That was something else. I mean, I was, you know, it's blowing 30, but I was in two to three foot of water the whole time, so it wasn't that bad. And, uh, I tell you, I'm glad to be here. Because right around this corner is beach, so I don't have to deal with that anymore. I'm, I'm home, free, home free for tonight. I am home free for tonight. Today I crossed to the western side of the bay at the Bay Bridge. All right, I'm almost there. And this is my next to last big crossing but this is easy but comparatively easy because of the pilings I can I can hide behind pilings and get behind get out of the current in the eddies of the pilings I like bridges and this one is really cool bridges on tour are often the only time you get shade on the water folks were catching white perch but I wanted to get across that's a wall. <laughs> I really couldn't have timed that out better. Yeah, I crossed right the... Oh, look at that. I actually got lucky enough to get there right at the slack current, and I was able to cross during slack current, you know, aim my nose right down the bridge and, uh, and shoot across. And as I got to this side, right at this bend, the current started picking up, so I it couldn't get better timing. Plus, a ship just went by. <laughs> First landing on the western side of the tour. Uh, 
I was planning on staying when I landed. I've got a uh, got a good another 10 miles to go before I can get to the, the next campsite. It was either here or I had to go a little ways. It's only noon. I have a north wind with the outgoing current. I can make it today. It was a long day and I was tired by the end. One thing I'm like about this western shore already is afternoon shade. Don't have any of this on the other side. One of the most reoccurring questions I get about touring is do I get bored at the end of the day without a TV or computer? The answer is really never. My evening entertainment is watching a day come to a close. Watching the Ospreys play is my evening TV show. I don't think I can stare at a small computer screen when there's a life-size one out in front of me. Well, I'm on my way to Chesapeake Beach to meet up with Shante, but uh, it's in southeast, straight off the water at 15 right through here. I can't get these two miles. I'm going to have to go back here to this beach inside this cove. Well, I got blown out from going around the corner. I'm in Herring Bay and got a little point that comes out that's blocking all the southeast 15 mile an hour winds. They jumped the forecast up the small craft advisory for this afternoon. Shantae's coming. She's going to meet me at that marina and meet me out here um, later on this evening. I've got a real tight spot above high tide here. Let's see what I can do with it. High tide's going to come up pretty high. It's coming up on, on a new moon. Just had a fox pop out over here. Here comes Shantae and Dale Bennett. Hey, baby. <laughs> the next day, we had the winds to make it to Chesapeake Beach for a marina stop. This is a busy marina. Lots of charter boats for this fantastic fishery. And the rod and reel tackle shop. We stopped at the first big cliffs that we saw. These are the cliffs just south of Chesapeake Beach. These are pretty cool. These are definitely the same height as the cliffs up on the Susquehanna Flats, but uh, different, more, um, more clay in this, not so much rock. I'm not seeing the same rock beaches as it was up there. But definitely some uh, awesome cliffs here. There's no rocks in here. All these rocks on the bottom that look like rocks are actually just clay. So uh, there's no rocks, just all clay. That's what makes it different from from the Susquehanna and, and the northern cliffs. These cliffs are famous for fossil hunters and more specifically shark teeth, ancient shark teeth hunters. And you can see the layer of shells on the bottom of this cliff. I'm not seeing so much up in the top or upper layers, but right here at the bottom of this cliff, you can see the ancient seafloor, uh, mud and shell layers. Just north of our destination at Parker's Creek were these cliffs that we could paddle right up next to. It's clay. It's all clay. But there was something I didn't think about. 
Wow. Piece falling off. Another great destination of this tour has been Parker's Creek. With two cliffs on each side and the creek going down this valley, it was another remote and beautiful beach. The cliffs in this area made sighting the distance deceiving. On flat land, you can pretty much see the shoreline at about seven miles away. Cove Point out there in the distance looks a lot closer, but it's really over 12 miles away. Now on this cliff, what I didn't see on the other ones was there's three layers of shells. So there's three ocean bottoms on this cliff face here. One on the bottom right there, one in the middle, and then one pretty close up to the top. Keep putting my feet in the water and keep getting hit by these jellyfish. <laughs> I'm just getting stung 15 times a day. Yeah, lots of jellyfish. They would swarm and clump up around these fish carcasses. <laughs> you nasties, nobody yeah, likes right you. It's ramen, that's what they make ramen out of. Here you go, baby. Are you holding it? Yeah. Are you stupid? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? Most long distance touring kayakers don't take fishing gear with them. I never understood that. An epic schoolie striper blitz like this would be a shame to miss. Shante and I drifted with this action for a couple of hours, heading towards Cove Point and the Calvert Cliffs. <laughs> oh, look at that. I didn't even cast. He's got him right there. Can't pull him. This is the Calvert Cliffs area, and there's some bigger fossilized shells in, in these in these parts. Whoa! <laughs> I didn't even put it in. I just, I just hit the water.
one got some tug to it. What? This one got some tug into it. Yeah, nice one. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I just got off. We camped out for the night at the base of Cove Point. We were on the property of the tanker refueling deal, but I knew we were going to get kicked off this beach. Quick uh, deviation from the day of sitting on the beach. I looked down the beach and saw those stripers blitzing down there, and they're really close to shore. So we got this southwest wind, and we're going to be able to stay out of it stay close to shore and, set, and still catch stripers today. So I'm all about paddling backwards if I have to go catch fish rather than sitting on this beach all day long. Kick us off anyway. We, we have to leave anyway. That's cool. I didn't want to be on the beach anyway. The stripers were hidden. Whoa. Mm. This is Cove Point Lighthouse, built in 1828. When we got around the corner, we were hit with the day ending headwind. Across the water was Taylor's Island, where I was nearly three weeks ago. We stayed on the north beach of Cove Point, where we met Linda, who taught us how to finally find some shark's teeth. Aha. Really small and kind of brown. Seems like the best way to find them instead of just staring at one spot, just kind of walk up and down right where the wash is and you kind of see them tumbling around. They're either really black or you know just a shape and you see a dark, dark color tumbling around in the wash, just bend down and kind of look at it. This is amazing. What? Every night I get my gear ready for the next day. I fill my deck water bottles and get anything I need out of the stern and that hatch is secure. Everything else that's out is the stuff that I need for the night. All of this gear goes in my bow hatch. On my left side goes my sleeping mat. This is kind of egg crate style sleeping mat. This is campsite security. Just a slim line machete. 
any critters get too close I can stick them it's a waterproof light this stays in my bedroll and this has duct tape that I use in case I need to stick some duct tape if I have a rip inside the tent while I'm in here, I can secure it. Shantae forgot her sleeping mat, so at Chesapeake Beach, she bought a pool float for a bed. My tent goes on the right side. Rinse off all the sand that's stuck to the tarp so it doesn't end up in my boat. Then this goes right in the middle, shoved up as far as I can. This is the two pillows and, and two blankets. For my bedding, I have two pillows. and two blankets. And these blankets are actual military military poncho liners. And these things have ties on them, so they're great for extra shade when you have a day down. All of this goes in a compression sack and is hammered in. In the very front of my bow, I have my mosquito suit. I've only worn it twice, in the Everglades and on Assateague Island in Maryland. But it's always in the bow of my boat. Then my extra camera goes in. Then battery bag, duct tape, bug spray, toiletries and first aid bag, and my camp camera. Then my clothes bag fits right between that and the camera. My pee jar gets squeezed in there somewhere. This is my boat grabber. It grabs the stuff on the inside that might slide away from me. Get a rubberized hooked on that side and a pad on that side for shoving them in. Toilet paper stays up front also. This is the E tool. Kind of a military style shovel. Screws there, the whole thing folds up. And this is a Gerber model. It's a little lighter than the military issue. The military issue will work for just as well. But this is a tent spike pounder, bathroom digger, and wood chopper if you need it. This goes inside up front. We stopped at the last cliff of the tour before heading to Solomon's Island for Marina Stop. <laughs> well, Shante and I made it through, or made it around this naval base here um, with a bad headwind. It was nasty and bulkheads all along the sides, which made it reflect off and just was literally a washing machine but at least we had a good beach at the end of the day to recover on. Ever since we were able to find those shark's teeth, Shantae wants to stop at every cliff that has a beach on it. <laughs> to look for shark's teeth. They're not down here, they're all up there, but she wants to stop at everywhere and look at rocks. And... This is a really cool spot. This is on the way to Point No Point. A lot of these spots are like this. They're a lake, but the, the entrances and the inlets have been shoaled over and washed over. So these are always really good places to target because there's going to be a huge beach here. It's washed over and washed over so many times that it's become a huge, nice, flat, out of high tide uh, spot. We 
made it to Point Lookout in the lee of the land. But to get to the next beach, we had to paddle into the wind. We made it to Point Lookout, and tomorrow we're going to attempt to cross. The winds are forecasted at northwest, 5 to 10, so that's going to give us a slight tailwind. It's a long crossing. It's a six-mile, six-and-a-half-mile crossing. But tomorrow's going to be the perfect day. Otherwise, if we didn't make it tomorrow, we would have a southwest wind at 5 to 10 on Friday. And then if we didn't make it then, we would be here over the weekend. We would be stuck up here for two days with southwest winds 10 to 15 until Monday. And that's the whole deal with touring. The game is, can I get to my next water refill stop before I run out? The opposing factors are the mileage, the winds, and the currents. How far is it before my next water refill? What are the winds going to be doing on the way there? And how can I work with the currents to get there? That's the whole game of touring. So we're making it tomorrow. We're going to shoot, shoot across tomorrow. It's going to be a long day, long morning anyway, getting across that, the mouth of, of the Potomac River here. And um, I'm even going to dump waters out to make sure I'll have a light kayak when I go across in case I do take on water. I can take on more if I have less fresh water, drinking water inside. I also tried to waterproof my leaking rod holders. With the best kayak repair kit on tour, super glue and duct tape. Welcome back to Virginia. Finally made it. Made it over here in two hours, six miles in two hours. But the duct tape patches over my rod holders worked. I think that was my major problem. Uh, it wasn't my hatch, my hatch is fine. It was just the uh, the rotters running through the, the holes in the um, in the rod holders. So I took that up and I didn't get a lot of water and I think I'm good to go. Should have done this the first day and I wouldn't have sank on the, the crossing of the Chesapeake Bay. This would have relieved some of my sinking anxieties about paddling in heavy winds. We headed into Smith Point Inlet. And stopped at Smith Point Marina for laundry, showers, and water refills. On the way out, <laughs> we ran into some little reds. And we camped on the outside beach. We took the day off to recover from the previous long mileage days, and it was windy anyway. I fished the inlet, and Shante made sand turtles. Shante's day off. <laughs> yeah. That log adds an added little structure along with this bulkhead. So that's where I cast and caught two little reds. Let's do it again. Then, out of nowhere, with no warning, a blitz erupted. They had bait fish pinned up against the rocks. The lure I was using first was too heavy. Then I tied on a swim shad. There we go. 
go. Nice one. Whoa. got strong at the end of the day, so we went up on the rocks. Whoa, whoa, this is a much bigger one. Whoa, whoa. I guess the crowd, I'm not used to seeing it in one place. <laughs> It's a completely different fight. Wow. <laughs> there we go. Wow. Hey, look at that. That is a nice size up right here. Okay. I don't know what to do here. <laughs> I've had to do this before either. <laughs> is it 26 or so? Real pretty. Yeah, it's very much. The next day we were able to paddle. It was hot, real hot, and we were looking for some shade. Just had to stop and get some shade. This is one of those 110 degree heat index days, and it uh, feels every bit of it. We paddled pretty far, but we didn't get all the way to Bluff Point. But we did come across this really cool beach, really uh, shaded. And that was what was the main thing that we were needing today. And uh, it was pretty windy at that point of the day when we stopped around 3 o'clock. And uh, now the wind's died, and it's sweltering again. And it's a, it's a beautiful beach and a beautiful spot, but it's kind of hard to take in the beauty when you're sweating to death. <laughs> Shantae paddled close to these old stumps, which had hatchet marks. I wondered what old ships these trees were built with. Me and Shantae looked for arrowheads this morning and just found some shade for the rest of the day. We're going to go back and look for some more at low tide. But today was a stay in the shade day. So that was our mission today is me and Shantae were just going to go here and spend the day looking for arrowheads and starting to find some. And our cold front finally hits. <laughs> no rain, which is cool. I mean, we might get some rain later, but it's just a, a, a wind shift and it would instantly got white capping out there. This driftwood teepee is built by the locals and then turned into a bonfire in the fall. A friend of mine from this area, Don Davison, told me about the arrowheads, teepee beach, and the shortcut behind Windmill Point. Across the Rappahannock River to Deltaville and the Norview Marina for a water refill. This can be tricky landing on a dock, on a floating dock. Come up beside it, make sure your paddle's all secured. Stabilize your boat right next to it, just make sure you're not drifting away. Pull your feet, your heels under your butt, and just shift your weight over, but leave your feet in. And it's the same way. And getting in. 
Got your boat stabilized, not pushing out. Put your feet in the same position and shift your weight from your butt to your feet and then sit down. Here's how my waters go in at a dock. I've got two waters already in beside my hips on the uh, on the insides, and then I put two more along the sides. There. And then I put these two gallon jugs. Make sure the caps are tight and closed. Put those right against my back. Ugh. Then the food bag goes in. Tarts along the side and the smarties. Shantae got a ride to the store for some snacks with our new friend Spud. When we came around Stingray Point, the wind came up on us, which made the Pianca Tank River a little hairy and tiring. After a long day's paddle, finally made it here to Gwyn's Island. And I just ran over a red as I landed. So now my eyeballs are all peeled onto the water and I should be getting the camp together. But uh, this is a real good spot. This is the south end of Gwyn's Island. It's a series of spits and little islands. And uh, it's a really cool place. Really good fishery from what I hear too. A lot of reds and specks come out of this area. I just ran one over and there's striper a little striper popping off that point over there but I gotta break I gotta get camp together <laughs> first thing I want to see when I open my eyes in the morning is that flag I want to see it laying there calm. Of course, the calm wind didn't last. We were worn out by the time we got to New Point Comfort. And we were trying to get inside the Mob Jack Bay to get to my friend Miles' house. Miles and his wife Chris were kind enough to offer us a beautiful place to stop while on tour. My mom lives close by and stopped in to take me to the store. We took a relaxing day off. It's too hot. <laughs> Alright, so my rivet broke on my hatch cover latch. Hatch cover latch. <laughs> and how I'm going to fix it is just pulling the string through and tying a bunch of knots in it. Field repair, had to do the same thing here. <laughs> this rivet went yesterday. Hat secured. This, my uh, deck loop went out. So I just threaded, threaded it through the deck loop holes. Miles paddled with us the morning we left. We got to the mouth of the York River with some headwind, but we decided to jump across and get to a good spot on the other side with bad weather forecasting. Now we did the York River crossing in just, just about an hour, and uh, just in time too, because a ship from the power plant just took off. And a thunderstorm's on its way. Here it comes.
like to put my tent up before a big storm. If I think there's going to be time after the storm, I'm going to wait. I just hunker down away from anything metal and hope that this isn't the storm that's going to get me. <laughs> that was a real intense storm and it was Shantae's first on tour storm yeah. and that was a brutal one that was a uh, that was mean hard hard rain hurting stinging painful rain sand blasting sand blasting you know sand, the rain hitting the sand so hard that it kicks the sand up and then the wind drives the sand into you I told Shantae earlier in the day when I saw this storm on way way back in the horizon I said we're gonna have some excitement this afternoon after the rain the no seams come out So me and Shantae took the day off after the big storm yesterday and we have cold fronts come through and we had northeast winds at 15 to 20 all day long. So we had this good spot here and we had our spot in the shade where we could nap out all day long. This is the next to the last day of the tour so we took it easy today. Tomorrow we should be able to get to Grandview and that is the last camp of the tour and we head home. We had a fairly easy morning with some light winds and some fishing stops. Then the wind kicked up for the afternoon. of the tour is at Grandview. And thank you Dale Bennett for bringing us some barbecue out here on our last night on tour. It's delicious! So last day on tour, got a long way to go and hopefully the winds aren't going to come up on us. And I got a giant bag of trash. <laughs> We didn't make it far before the east wind ended it. Yeah, this is it. I've already kind of pulled the plug on it. My dad's going to come and bring the truck for me so we can uh, drive on home. There's no more campsites between Grandview and home. This strong open water east wind makes it pretty much impossible to do. Although disappointing, it really doesn't matter that we didn't get the finish on the last day. Touring for me is about just being out there, spending the time paddling and exploring places that I've only seen on the maps. Now when I look at the maps, I know what those places look like. 